I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. In today's episode, I'm going to be telling you about the world-famous director, Roman Polanski. In 1977, Roman Polanski was convicted of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl named Samantha Gailey. Now, Samantha now goes by Samantha Geimer, and she actually wrote a book about this experience. And that's going to be my main source for this episode. The book is called The Girl, A Life in the Shadow of Roman Polanski. Samantha is actually an incredible writer, too. I mean, aside from the fact that this, the story is horrifying, her writing just is captivating. I mean, this book was hard to put down, despite how freaking difficult it is to read. Also, I have a weird echo going on right now, don't I? <laughs> I'm really sorry. I have to record this episode in my bedroom, which is surrounded by mirrors, because, well, it's Sunday and my kids are home, but I didn't want to put this episode off any longer. Unfortunately, my kids don't really have a silent mode. I have three of them, and they're all feral. So, wish me luck. It's either a little bit of echo, or a whole lot of screaming, or no episode, so... I work with what I have, which at this current moment is all of the random shit I've crocheted, like scarves and sweaters and half-made hats and a bunch of yarn, literally surrounding my microphone to try to block out the freaking mirror acoustics. But here we are. So first of all, I currently have a giveaway going on for the month of October, and it's almost over. So here are the details directly from me in case you want to participate before it's over. I am giving away a $25 gift card for Spencer's, which can also be used at the Spirit Halloween stores. The winner will also receive their very own Broken Limelight t-shirt. All you have to do is like Broken Limelight on Facebook. If you don't already know, the site is facebook.com slash broken limelight. You can also find the link on brokenlimelight.com. So you get your first entry by liking the page. You can get additional entries by sharing any of the posts that are about the giveaway. You can tag up to five friends in the post for up to five additional entries. You can give me a review on Apple. It needs to be done by the 20th, though, because it does take a couple of days for it to go through. And you can also write me a review on brokenlimelight.com on the review page. All of those things will get you an additional entry, and the winner will be announced on October 23rd. If you need more information on that, just head over to brokenlimelight.com and right there on the home page, you'll see something that says October giveaway. And if you click on that page, you'll get all the information there. I also want to thank all those people who have given me positive reviews even before knowing about this giveaway, because those are really organic reviews and they help my podcast a lot, obviously. But it also means a lot to me that you guys did this without any kind of incentive. So since my podcast is brand new, anybody who has already given me a review on Apple, I'm going to go ahead and include you guys in this raffle as well. All right, well, now that we've got all that covered, let's get down to business. So like I said, Roman Polanski is a world-famous director. He's probably most well-known not just for being Sharon Tate's husband, but he directed films like Rosemary's Baby and Chinatown. He was born in 1933 in Paris, France. His father was Jewish and originally from Poland, and his mother was originally from Russia. They moved back to Poland to the city of Krakow in 1937, which was not a good idea. They were living in Krakow when World War II started with the invasion of Poland in 1939. Roman's family and thousands of Jews were moved to what they called the Krakow Ghetto. All Jewish kids were removed from school and the adults were forced to wear these armbands to show that they were Jews. They started rounding up all of the Jews and Roman actually witnessed an elderly Jewish woman get shot in the street by an SS officer when he was just a little boy. When they started emptying out the ghetto and taking people to the concentration camps, Roman lost his childhood friend named Pavel to the concentration camp. He says that that was his first ever heartbreak. And pretty much Roman's whole family was also taken to the concentration camp. His father, his mother, and his two half-sisters were taken. And by the way, his mother was actually pregnant, and she was murdered shortly after being taken to the camp. That is so eerie to me when you know what happens to his wife Sharon 30 years later, while she's also pregnant. 
I, I can't imagine how horrifying that would be to experience with two people you love twice in your life like that. Roman actually watched his father forced to march in a line and taken to a camp that was known for, it was known for working their prisoners to death. Roman was able to escape the ghetto, and he stayed in a rural area with a, a Roman Catholic family that was, like, close with his family, and they kind of took him in. They were hiding him. He was just 30 miles outside of Auschwitz, but because he was in hiding, he really didn't know the extent of what was happening outside of this house. Fortunately, he was able to pass as a Roman Catholic boy for the most part. That didn't exactly mean that he was safe. He still had to spend some of his childhood, like, living off of berries and running away from German officers. And, of course, he always had to lie about his identity and, you know, who and where his parents were. After the war, he found out that his father and sister had actually survived. Miraculously, he found his father, and his father told him about all the horrific details of what he, what he had experienced and witnessed at the concentration camps. When Roman was 14, he started acting in plays and eventually moved on to appear in Polish films. At about 20 years old, he got into directing. In 1962, he directed his first feature film, Knife in the Water, which won an Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. In 1965, he directed the movie Repulsion, and in 1966, the movie Cul-de-sac. With all that success, he signed up to do the movie Fearless Vampire Killers. At that time, Roman was dating an actress named Jill St. John, and he really wanted her to play the lead role. But if you remember from my last episode, Sharon Tate was contracted with this guy named Martin Ranzehoff, we'll call him Marty, and Marty was producing the film, and Marty ultimately had the final say, and he pushed and he pushed and he pushed for Sharon Tate to take the lead role. After working together for a few weeks on the film, Sharon and Roman eventually started to warm up to each other, Sharon was still dating Jay Sebring at the time, so they were really just friends. I guess one day Sharon was like, hey, you want to do some acid? And I guess Roman, like, really didn't like acid. He had done it a couple times, but he didn't really enjoy it. Which, like, I, I'm not that surprised by that. I mean, I would not unlock those doors with all that trauma that he has survived. But nonetheless, I guess they hung out together and they did acid together. At some point, Roman put on a Frankenstein mask and snuck up behind Sharon. Sharon freaked the fuck out and she was like pissed at him, which I can understand. I mean, that would be fucking terrifying to be tr like tripping like that. And then Frankenstein comes up behind you in his defense. I mean, he was tripping. <laughs> Just so you know, I didn't actually get that little fact from Samantha's book. I believe that was in Roman Polanski's biography. If you listen to another podcast called Hollywood Crime Scene, they're fantastic. One of my favorite podcasts. They actually filled in a lot of the blanks for me. So I highly recommend them if you want to get more information. So I guess after this whole Frankenstein acid experience, Sharon was pissed and kind of avoiding Roman, and Roman would call her up for weeks, just like trying to get her to talk to him. One time, Sharon answered the phone and just said, listen, fuck you. <laughs> I want to put that on a t-shirt. I want to get an exclusive uh, Broken Limelight t-shirt with a quote that says, listen, fuck you, and then Sharon Tate at the bottom. At the beginning of filming for this movie, I guess Roman was still pretty unconvinced by Sharon's acting. He ultimately was like, okay, but she needs to wear a red wig. I guess Jill St. John was a redhead. I don't know. Like, he wants a redheaded person for this. So he was really difficult to work with. He would make Sharon do take after take after take. He had her do like 70 takes, literally. And he had her on the verge of tears. But the more time Sharon spent with him, she started to see the, the complexity in his personality and really admired his take charge attitude and his determination to make things perfect. He was just looking at the big picture trying to make a spectacular film. So in the end, she found it kind of admirable. The more time they spent together, the more they started to fall in love. Even though Roman still slept around and he told Sharon that, you know, that's just who he is and it's not really in him to stop. And for some reason, Roman pulled a lot of hot chicks. 
and he was not a hot dude. Sharon even said so. She was quoted as calling him interesting looking, but she told him, I don't want to smother you. I only want to be with you. And he said, you know how I am. I screw around. And she said, I don't want to change you. So he always continued to sleep around. And he was known as kind of a womanizer. And Sharon knew that. And she would kind of defend him just saying, you know, he's French and things are different there. And she kind of chopped it up to it being a more open-minded perspective. It's believed that maybe Sharon wasn't always okay with it, but she accepted it, or maybe she hoped he would eventually decide to settle down and only be with her. In 1968, Roman and Sharon got married in London. That same year, one of Roman's biggest films ever was released, Rosemary's Baby. The movie starred Mia Farrow. Mia Farrow continues to support Roman Polanski and calls him a friend, which I think is super weird. If you've listened to my episodes about Woody Allen, Mia Farrow claims to be against sexual abuse of children, and she called Woody Allen a monster for it, so it's super, super weird to me that she still supports Roman Polanski. Anyway, Rosemary's Baby made Roman a superstar. In the early months of 1969, Sharon Tate found out that she was pregnant with Roman's baby. At first, she was afraid to tell him because she knew that pregnancy and babies reminded him of tragedy just like his mother who had died in the Holocaust while pregnant. Sharon and Roman both spent the summer in Europe to film movies, and they planned to meet up and take the Queen Elizabeth II back to Los Angeles, just in time for Sharon to have the baby. They sublet their house to their friends Wojtek Frykowski and Abigail Folger, the heiress of the Folger Coffee. She also went by Gibby. So they sublet their house to them so that they could kind of watch over the house and everything while they were gone. At the end of July, they were scheduled to take their ship back, but Roman called Sharon at the very last minute and told her he wasn't ready to go home. He had too much work to finish up, so she really wanted to wait for him and fly home, but she was already like eight and a half months pregnant by this point, so they wouldn't let her on a plane. So she was pretty much left with no other choice than to get on a ship home. On Friday, August 8, 1969, Roman called Sharon to let her know that he would be home the following Tuesday. That night, he went out with his friend, Victor Lounce, who Victor ran the Playboy clubs in Europe as well as Playboy Enterprises. Roman was a huge fan of these clubs. According for Victor, the two of them went out for drinks, and Roman got friendly with a, quote, bimbo and took her home. The next morning, Sharon Tate, along with her friends Abigail Folger, Wojtek Frykowski, and Jay Sebring, and also a boy named Stephen Parent were found dead in Roman and Sharon's home, or on the property anyway. They had been murdered by members of the Manson family. Roman's manager called him in London to tell him that Sharon and the baby, along with four others, were murdered in his home. Roman broke down. He had to be heavily sedated. He flew home the very next day. The moment he stepped off the plane in L.A., he was hounded by the press. He said that not being home that night is the biggest regret of his life. Now let's talk about Samantha Gailey, also known as Samantha Geimer. Samantha Gailey was the daughter of actress Susan Gailey, who appeared in the 1975 film Starsky and Hutch. Susan wanted to get both of her daughters, Samantha and her sister Kim, into acting, so she got them headshots and had them go on auditions from an early age. Samantha was a tomboy, but she was adorable. So her mom never made her dress up or take off her regular clothes or try to make her look more feminine looking. So Samantha didn't really mind going on the auditions or anything. When Samantha was 13, her older sister Kim was dating a guy named Henry who introduced their mom to Roman Polanski. One day in 1977, Henry showed up saying that Roman Polanski was interviewing young American girls for a photo shoot he was doing for Vogue Paris. So Susan told Samantha about it and Samantha agreed to meet with Roman. Roman showed up, and as they sat in the living room, he basically explained that they were doing a story on the differences between American girls and French girls. He showed Samantha and her parents a spread that he had done with Natasha Kinski. Natasha Kinski, if you don't know, was another model at the time who was, I mean, she was a teenager also. She was like 14, 15 when she was really famous, and she was known for working with Polanski. 
He met her in 1976, and according to Roman's autobiography, he slept with her. He then learned that she was only 15 and continued to sleep with her for just a few months. Those are his words. In Samantha's own words, she, Samantha, was not an exceptional looking girl, and she didn't have the sex appeal that other models her age had, like Natasha Kinski and Brooke Shields. And that's a really weird thing for me to say, because they were literally children. The fucking 70s really went all out on sexualizing children. Brooke Shields was like 10 when she started posing nude, and she was only 12 when she starred in Pretty Baby, where she played an actual prostitute. I, I mean, obviously a child prostitute, but she, she, they, they made her, like, act sexy, you know? But in Samantha's perspective, she was 13, and she didn't feel sexy or feminine. So she was a little bit confused as to why Roman wanted to photograph her in the first place. But Samantha's mom and her stepdad looked so happy, and they were hanging on Roman's every word. So she felt a little bit of pressure, like this was, you know, this was a good idea. Roman came back a few days later with his camera to do a test shoot. He and Samantha... He and Samantha walked up to a hill just down the street and started shooting. He was kind of sighing and muttering how he just couldn't get the right shot. She had brought two shirts to change into, so he told her to change into a new one. She turned her back and started to change her shirt, and she was surprised to hear the camera click. He was taking pictures of her, and she clearly wasn't ready. They continued shooting, and she could just tell that he wasn't happy with the shots he was getting. So she kept trying to look sexier and more feminine and grown up and try to be like the other models that he was used to shooting. He finally told her to just take the top off altogether. Mind you, they're in public, like on a hill where people are walking by with their dogs and on their bikes right down the street from her house. But she was just like, I'm a professional. You know, she wanted to prove herself. So she wanted to rise to the challenge. Roman seemed happier with the shots at this point. Someone rode by on a dirt bike and Roman asked if that bothered her. And she said no. She was trying to be mature and act like she was a pro at this. In her head, she's probably like, I bet Natasha Kinski wouldn't be bothered by that. After the shoot, Roman took her home. Samantha figured the shoot went well because Roman called her mom and arranged a second shoot for Vogue. Her parents were super stoked. On March 10th, 1977, Roman picked her up for the shoot. Samantha actually asked her friend Terry to come along, but Roman was rushing them out the door. As they were about to get in the car, her friend was like, how long is this going to take? I have to be home by a certain hour. And Roman was like, mm, you know, it's going to take a while. Maybe you should just go home. So she was like, okay. And she got on her bike and she went home. Samantha's mom thought that all three of them had left together. She actually didn't realize that Terry wasn't there until later on. So first Roman and Samantha stopped at the home of Jacqueline Bissett, who offered Samantha a glass of wine. Samantha thought it was weird because she was only 13, but Jacqueline said that she had no idea she was underage. But I'm telling you, at 13, Samantha definitely looked like a minor. There's, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually upload pictures of her to brokenlimelight.com so you can see. I mean, not only did she look like a minor, but Samantha says herself how in all of these encounters, she wasn't actually wearing a bra because she didn't actually need a bra yet. So I really find it hard to believe that Jacqueline Bissett didn't know this was a child. While they were there, they took a few photos, but Roman started complaining that there just wasn't enough light left in the day. So he took her to his friend's house, Jack Nicholson's. On the car ride there, he started asking her questions like, Do you have a boyfriend? And have you ever had sex? The truth was that Samantha didn't have a boyfriend anymore. She was dating a 17-year-old boy who actually dumped her because he thought that she was too young. But they had had sex once. That's the only time Samantha's ever had sex. And it was really nothing memorable, according to Samantha. But she didn't want to sound like a little kid, so she lied. And she was like, yeah, I have a boyfriend. And she also told him that she's had sex twice. Which is just so, like such a little kid thing to do to be like I don't want to seem like a loser so I'm going to tell him I did it twice not just once Samantha was really trying to sound mature she said something like 
I've seen a Playboy magazine once. When they got to Jack Nicholson's house, Jack wasn't actually there. The only person there was a maid, but she left shortly after they arrived. Roman popped open a bottle of champagne and served a glass for each of them. They started shooting in the living room, and he asked again for her to take her top off. She figured he must be trying to take one of those photos just showing above the shoulders, just to give the illusion of nudity. No one will actually see her naked. It's no big deal. At first, she was just posing with the glass of champagne, but as he was telling her how to pose, he started telling her, drink it, hold the glass to your lips, now lower it, sit, look at me, look over there, sip a little. She drank it, and he refilled her glass. She tried to pace herself, but she was also trying to focus on doing a good job. He kept refilling her glass, so it was really hard to keep track of how much she actually drank. He had her change into a dress, and then they went up into the kitchen for more champagne. Samantha was sitting on the counter, like licking an ice cube, and Roman started shooting pictures of her. At this point, Samantha was aware that she was starting to feel buzz, but as she drank, she also started to feel sexier, so she tried to enjoy it, and she told herself, look at me, being sexy and mature, like the real models. She downed another glass, he refilled it, and then he said, Let's take some photos in the jacuzzi. But first, he suggested that she should call her mom and check in. Oh, what a good guy, you know. This probably made her trust him a little bit more. So she called her mom, and she told her then that her friend Terry didn't end up coming along. Her mom sounded a little nervous, and she offered to pick her up, but Samantha was actually pretty, she was feeling pretty comfortable by this time, and she insisted that she was fine. She probably was starting to have fun and thinking she was doing a good job with the modeling. And Roman was starting to act like he was finally pleased with her and the photos he was getting, so she thought she was just starting to get it right. She had to keep going. By now it's dark outside, but Roman assures Samantha's mom that he's going to have her home soon. Samantha didn't have a swimsuit for the jacuzzi, so she figured she could just wear her underwear in the jacuzzi and the bubbles would cover everything up. And like I said, Samantha wasn't yet wearing a bra. As she's just about to get into the jacuzzi, Roman offered her part of a quaalude. Initially, she says no, but then he asks if she's ever had one, which, of course, she hasn't, but she again doesn't want to seem uncool, so she says she's had it before, but she just doesn't like it. But then he keeps asking, are you sure you don't want just a little piece? So she figures he wants me to take it, so she does. And remember, her judgment's already impaired from who knows how many glasses of champagne. Samantha started to feel really relaxed, like her muscles felt like they were turning into jello. He asked her to take her panties off. She figured it was just because they were ruining the shot, like they were too dark in color and they were showing up underwater. So she figured since it was just for artistic purposes, she was just going to take her underwear off. And she grabbed her champagne and she posed for a few more shots. But after a little while, Roman says, this is no good. There's not enough light. He then put his camera down and started to get into the jacuzzi. This is when Samantha really started to get uncomfortable. Roman took off his clothes, including his underwear, and got in the jacuzzi. He was on the opposite side of Samantha, so he said, come here. She panicked, but she's also feeling really weighed down by the quaaludes and the water. Then he says again, come here, I want you to feel something. So she's hesitant, but she walked over a little bit closer to him, and he grabbed her by the waist and pulled her in closer to him, and he held her above one of the jets so she could feel the bubbles between her legs. He said, see, doesn't that feel good? She got really, really uncomfortable and said, I can't breathe, I have asthma, which wasn't true, but she was trying to get the fuck away from him. So she tried to back away, but his grip on her was really firm, so... (laughs) She she was getting really uncomfortable, and he started to see it in her face, like she was struggling. So he suggested that maybe she should jump into the pool to cool off. She took his advice and jumped in, and she swam straight to the other side and then hopped out and ran right into the house. After a little bit, he went inside to check on her and said, how's your asthma? She replied, I need to go home and take my medicine. And he said, I'll take you home soon. She told him, I need to go now. But he says, you'll be okay and he told her to just lie on the bed and rest. She said, I have to go home, but he took her by the shoulders and walked her to the bedroom. 
He sat her down on a big velvet couch and asked her if she was okay. She said, no, I'm not okay. I better go home now. He assured her that she would be all right. He held her arms down at her side and started kissing her. Samantha said, no, come on. But between the pill and the champagne, she says that her own voice sound, sounded far away. He kissed her face and he touched her breasts. He asked again if she liked it, but she couldn't even answer him. Um, this is a direct quote from the book. I'm, I'm just going to read this to you. Then he goes down on me. I know what this is, of course, because I've read about it but have never actually had someone do it to me. He asks if it feels good, which it does, and that in itself is awful. I don't want this. My mind recoils, but my body is betraying me. And that's when I check out. I go far, far away. There's a sense of complete and utter emptiness. Oh, just my body. I'm not really in here. Okay, I see. And this just breaks my heart because... It's really relatable, and I am sure a lot of other women can relate to this, but the whole body betraying you, and that's why I hate when uh, men think that, you know, a woman's body will reject rape, because it's ridiculous, you know what I mean? We're, bio we're biological organisms, like, anyway, I don't want to go off on that. It just, it just really broke me to hear that. And I also think that's why people think that men can't be raped, and that's just completely unfair. So anyway, Samantha decided to stop fighting. It was really exhausting, and she was also kind of relieved that he wasn't going to kill her. She figured that after this, she would get to go home, so she was just going to let it be over with. By this point, he is full-on having sex with her. But he stopped for a second, and he said, Are you on birth control? And she told him no. Then he asked her if she wanted him to enter her in the back. She said no, but she didn't really understand what he meant by that anyway. He then penetrated her anally, even after she said no. Samantha didn't even know that this was a thing that people do. After it was over with, she noticed that she was wet from behind. He had finished in her anus. Then when she finally thought it was over, there was a knock on the door. Roman called back saying that they'd be out in just a minute, so Samantha got up and put on her underwear. But Roman put his hands on her shoulders again before taking her underwear back off. Then he started at it again. As soon as they were done, Samantha got dressed and ran out to the car and waited for Roman to drive her home. She started crying. She was instantly blaming herself for taking the pill, for taking the champagne, for posing topless. She was analyzing everything she did and, you know, blaming herself completely. Roman kind of lingered inside talking to the woman. He came out and saw Samantha crying, and he asked if she was okay. She said yes, and then he said, yeah, you'll be all right. On the car ride home, Roman said to Samantha, don't tell your mother. This will be our little secret. Samantha was pretty mortified, and she didn't want anybody to know what had happened. She felt really stupid. Suddenly, she remembered that she lied and told Roman that she had asthma, and she started to get really nervous that Roman was going to mention it to her mom and that she would get caught in the lie. When they got home, when they got to Samantha's home, she jumped out of the car and bolted into the house. She whispered to her mom, if he asks, tell him I have asthma. I had to tell him that because I didn't want to get in the jacuzzi. And she's like, this probably made no sense to her, but she just ran to her room and slammed the door. She basically took off her shoes and sat in her room and just kind of cried. And she waited until she thought that Roman had left, and then she called her ex-boyfriend Steve and told him what happened. Initially, he found it really hard to believe. He was like, there's no way. That's not true. What Samantha didn't know was that while she was telling Steve this story over the phone, her sister Kim was sitting outside of her door listening, and she heard the whole thing. So before this happened, Roman actually came inside with Samantha and offered to show her parents some of the shots. He also brought a joint in for them to all smoke together. While hitting the joint and showing them the pictures, he actually showed them the shots of the test shoot where Samantha was topless. And he was totally nonchalant about it. Like, he was just showing them like it was going to be no big deal. The first thing Samantha's mom noticed was that the photos were awful. Like, some of the photos were taken prematurely when Samantha wasn't ready. The angles were all wrong. Her eyes would be half, half closed. The photos were unfocused. 
she couldn't believe it. Like, this is Roman fucking Polanski, and he's supposed to be shooting for Vogue. But when they got to the topless photos, Samantha's parents froze. Like, everything went dark and silent, and the family dog actually, like, picked up on the energy and started freaking the fuck out and pissed on the floor, which apparently, like, he'd never done that. And her mom started boiling, and she was like, get him out of here. And meanwhile, Kim is like, yelling at the dog, like, trying to get the dog to calm down. And Roman has the nerve to look at Kim and tell her something like, you really shouldn't treat a dog that way. Like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. The nerve of this man. Her stepdad is, like, fucking, like, everybody's in shock. So he just gives him the joint back and pretty much Uncle Phil them out of the house. At that point, the only thing they knew was that Roman took topless of photos of her. But they were fuming. After Kim overheard the phone call, she went back to her mom and said, he fucked her mom. And that's when her mom just broke. She went upstairs and asked her if he made her have sex with him, and Samantha said yes. At the advice of her accountant, Samantha's mom decided to call the police. They asked Samantha a bunch of questions, like, do you know what intercourse is? And did he strike you? And did he give you drugs? Samantha says that she would not have been so open about all these details if she weren't still high from the quaaludes. To this day, she wishes she had never opened her mouth. After she answered all of their questions, they asked if he did anything else. She, I guess, was too embarrassed to answer, so she whispered in Kim's ear. Kim took a deep breath and said, yes, he also put it in her butt. That part shocked their mom. Susan gasped and, like, grabbed her face and Samantha was truly confused like she didn't realize that this was so much worse than the other place. The police department told them that they had to talk to the district attorney and there was something really weird and secretive about this. They were told to park in like an underground parking structure instead of in front of the building. When they got there Samantha started to kind of revert and act like a baby she says that she was tired and she just wanted to be cared for. So she was like snuggling in her mom's lap and she would get into her, her stepdad's lap and just like snuggle with him. What they didn't know was that they thought Samantha's parents were lying and they were actually kind of forming this theory that Samantha, Samantha's stepdad, Bob, was the one molesting her. So the fact that she was like snuggling in his lap, like she truly just needed some affection, but they were like, eyeballing them and analyzing the situation and using that to kind of kind of fuel their theory. When they questioned Samantha, they asked her if she had ever had sex with Bob, her stepdad. At this point, Samantha was livid and she felt like she was the one being treated like a criminal. So she found this completely unfair. None of it made sense to her. Nobody seemed to be acting like they were like they had her in their best interest. A day or two later, Samantha saw her story in the newspaper. Nobody actually told him Roman was arrested. The newspaper was how they found out. It said, Film producer Roman Polanski has been arrested and booked on a charge of raping a 13-year-old girl. Polanski was arrested Friday night, a day after the rape allegedly occurred at the West Los Angeles home of actor Jack Nicholson. He was released on $2,500 bail. When they investigated Jack Nicholson's home, they actually found cocaine and arrested his girlfriend, Angelica Houston, as well. Before long, the newspapers were making up stories saying that Samantha's mom arranged for Polanski to take topless photos of, of Samantha and that she was pimping her out. In her book, Samantha stresses that that was not the case. Her mom certainly didn't turn a blind eye to the abuse or allow it to happen. Some newspapers went as far as to act like Samantha was like, a cunning Lolita who like people were even going as far as to say that she brought quaaludes and cocaine to Jack Nicholson's house. In 1984, Roman released an autobiography called Roman and he tells the story of Samantha as if it was some hot and steamy sexual encounter. It's fucking gross. He says, in all my many premonitions of disaster, one thought had never crossed my mind that I should be sent to prison my life and career ruined for making love. Roman tried to go on with business as usual. People in Europe were especially sympathetic to him and pretty much blamed Samantha for trying to ruin him. Then he was arrested at his hotel in front of a bunch of his friends. He seemed like he legit didn't know that he was doing anything wrong. 
But apparently when they arrested him, he was holding onto a quaalude in his hand and he tried to inconspicuously drop it. But the officer caught him and arrested him for that. Roman actually had a prescription for quaaludes for insomnia, but as he was in a hotel lobby with his friends, he clearly wasn't trying to take it to sleep. So they got a search warrant and they searched his hotel room. And there they found the films from Samantha's photo shoot, including the ones in the jacuzzi where she's naked from the waist down. Or I'm sorry, she's naked up to the waist. Angelica Houston agreed to testify for the prosecution in exchange for immunity on her drug possession charges. In her testimony, she describes Samantha as, She didn't appear to be distressed. She seemed sullen, which I thought was a little rude. She appeared to be one of those little chicks between, could be any age up to 25. You know, she didn't look like a scared little thing. About Polanski, she said, I have seen him as a man with compassion, not someone who would forcibly hurt another person. I don't think he's a bad man. I think he's an unhappy man. Samantha watched her mom and sister testify about meeting Roman and how everything went down when they got home. It was mortifying. When it was Samantha's turn to take the stand, they pulled out the underwear that she was wearing on the evening in question as evidence. Okay, so can you imagine being 13 years old in a courtroom full of adults with someone holding up and showing them your underwear and everyone in the room literally observing them for stains on them? So Samantha's underwear had residue on it, and they tried to test it. Oh, and they continuously called them panties, which just made Samantha, like, way more uncomfortable. Especially since she's thinking, every adult in this room is currently picturing me in my underwear. So they tested the underwear, and they found that it had semen in it, but not sperm. This is uncommon, but it is possible. It could be due to a low sperm count, which makes it interesting that he was asking her about being on birth control. But he was about 43 years old at this time. I know that's not that old, but it's not impossible either. In the 70s, they couldn't do much without the sperm, because the sperm would have given them more details than the semen would have at that time. So, of course, the, the defense tried to claim that the semen must belong to someone else. So first they show her underwear to the world, and now they're pretty much calling her a slut. And later on, both sides actually, like, fought over the underwear. They each wanted to get them tested by their own choice of lab, so the judge ultimately decided that the underwear would be cut in half so each side could get their own piece. Can you imagine? So they asked Samantha how they got to the point of taking the topless photos, and whether it was Roman's idea or hers. She said that she did it at Roman's suggestion, and she wasn't wearing a bra because, well, she didn't need one yet. They asked her what happened after he started kissing her. Samantha's mom didn't want her to use slang terms about the encounter, so she told her the word cunnilingus, but little Samantha didn't remember it right, and she told the court that Roman went down on her and started performing cuddliness. So they were like, what does that mean? And she said, it means he went down on me, or he placed his mouth on my vagina. He was just, like, licking, and I don't know. I was ready to cry. I was kind of... I was going, no, come on, stop it. But I was afraid. This poor girl, this must have been mortifying. She had to describe everything. The anal, the oral, the quaaludes. They asked her to describe Roman having an orgasm inside her butt and the semen leaking out. And then him leading her to the couch and doing it all again. Since Samantha had admitted to having sex before, Roman's team decided to dig into her sex life and kind of use it against her. They wanted to know if she had a tendency to lie or fantasize about her alleged sexual experiences. Those are his words, not mine. They also tried to get her to undergo psychiatric evaluation, but Samantha's team did try to fight that. Samantha's family became pretty reclusive since Samantha's name had been revealed in Europe, so now reporters were hounding the family. There was even someone parked outside of their house taking photographs of them, so they would, like, dodge under windows, and they booked it in and out of their houses. The courthouse was packed whenever Roman was supposed to make an appearance. So the judge actually had them empty out a nearby courthouse and rip the tables and the chairs out and fill it with desks and phones for journalists to do their work. That's a little weird. Samantha and her family didn't want the case to go to trial, they preferred for Roman to get off with a slap on the wrist than to have Samantha be traumatized from being cross-examined. Samantha's family actually decided to have Samantha undergo a psychiatric evaluation by someone of their choosing. 
The point of this was to try to say that going to trial would do more harm to Samantha. The psychiatrist determined that Samantha was indeed a healthy teenager, but there was just no telling exactly how much effect or potential trauma the trial could eventually lead to. After Polanski's team got the results back from the underwear, it was claimed that there was no presence of sperm and therefore they could not confirm whether or not it was Roman's. But for some reason, his team then decided to go for a plea bargain, something that would avoid prison time and deportation. I'm sorry, deport deportation. English is my second language. <laughs> so instead, Roman's team went with the only charge they could, unlawful intercourse. What the fuck is that even? Well, it was previously called statutory rape. But the district attorney was not willing to accept the plea bargain. Samantha and her family also wanted him to go for the plea bargain because they didn't really care to have his name drugged through the mud. They just wanted him to admit to what he did and get, you know, face some kind of consequence. But really, this whole thing was just dragging it out longer for them. Samantha and her family felt kind of like she was being sacrificed so that the DA could look good. So her lawyer was like, well, if they can't do the plea deal, then my client's not cooperating anymore. Sorry, we'll do whatever possible to avoid a trial. So they had to give in. Roman was going to plead guilty to the one charge and only get probation. The judge accepted the plea and Roman walked on the more serious charges. But Roman admitted to the rape on the record and Samantha was happy with that outcome. But the judge wasn't finished yet. See, he didn't want to look like a pussy, and he knew that people weren't going to like him letting Roman go without so much as a day in jail. So he told them, I'm going to sentence him to 90 days in the Chico State Prison for a diagnostic study. Nobody wanted this except the judge, and it was clear that he cared more about how he looked than about what happened to Samantha. He actually spoke to journalists to try to find out what the public opinion was predicted to be depending on his decisions. He was literally basing his decisions in the court on the public opinion. He actually made this like like a performance, like he put on his own little play. He actually took the attorneys to his chambers and told them what to say and when, and they pretty much had no they pretty much had no choice because they were afraid that the plea bargain was going to fall through and the case would go to trial if they didn't follow through with what the judge was telling them. In other words, he was directing them. So basically, he told them that he was going to sentence Roman to the 90 days, but behind the scenes, the defense was actually going to request deferrals in 90-day increments. That way, Roman would be able to go to Bora Bora and finish filming a film that he was working on. And then after a year, when everything has died down, the judge would make everything go away. By the way, this judge at one point said to Samantha and her mom, what do we have here, a mother-daughter hooker team? I'm not sure what the exact context was or how we got away with that, but it is something that Samantha mentioned in her book. Before Roman's diagnostic study, the judge let him go to Bora Bora. On his way, Roman stopped in Germany and went to Oktoberfest. He was photographed with young women all around him. Supposedly, the photos were cropped and the women's husbands and boyfriends were still in the shot too, but still, like, why the fuck would you pose for a picture at a time like this? So the judge was furious. He thought Roman was making a mockery of him, and he ordered him to come back to the United States. So Roman came back, and he was sent to fulfill his 90-day sentence at the Chino State Prison. For some reason that I really couldn't figure out, he was released after just 42 days. But I guess this wasn't the judge's decision, because at this point, he wanted to, ro he wanted to lock Roman up. On January 31st, 1978, the judge called all the attorneys to his chambers again. He angrily lectured them about how he was not going to allow Polanski to make a mockery of his courtroom. Then his little intercom buzzed, and he yelled at his assistant not to interrupt him. But she did anyway, and she said, Bill Farr's on the phone, and he took the call. Bill Farr was a reporter who was following the case. What was weird was that they seemed to be having some kind of really high-level decision-making conversation. And instead of it being, like, secretive, like how it seemed it should have been, it seemed almost like he was trying to show off, like, look at me, reporters calling me all the time. It was really weird. He was, like, super openly having this discussion. And the judge is saying things like, I'm not doing that, because if I did, I'd be seriously criticized by everyone, and I'm not going to be criticized for helping him. The attorneys were all dumbfounded that he was just taking this call right in front of them. 
And he spent like 30 minutes on the phone call, so they just like sat there at his desk and waited for him to finish. The judge then said into the phone that 42 days was just not enough for Roman. So now he's going to sentence him to an indeterminate sentence, which basically means exactly what it sounds like. It could be a week, could be 50 years. It's open. The judge saw that all the attorneys had shocked looks on their faces, so then he kind of said to them, don't worry about that. I want people to think I'm a tough sentencer, so we'll do this. And when the attention is off the case, Dalton, that's the defense attorney, Dalton will petition for a change of sentence and I will sentence him to time served. I'll put this forth tomorrow. They were shocked. Dude was changing his whole plan after one phone call with a reporter. The next day, Roman didn't show up for court. Instead, he hopped on a plane to London and then he went to France. In case you don't know, France doesn't extradite its own citizens under any circumstances. So Roman was basically able to move to France and go on with his life as a free man. Because don't forget, Roman was born in France. So he was a French citizen and he was highly respected. They were probably very, very proud to have him. And he was just off the hook. That was it. Except he basically can't leave France. So about a week later, all the attorneys got together and they filed a motion to have the judge disqualify him. The one thing that they all agreed on was his lack of professionalism. The judge filed an answer to the motion where he disputed it and said that he remained fair, but he resigned, basically saving himself from being disqualified. Still, he never acknowledged doing anything wrong. Samantha and her family were actually pretty relieved that Roman left the country. This was basically the end of her retelling the story over and over again. Roman continued his career in France for the next 30 years. In 1984, Roman published his autobiography, and after that, Samantha's name started coming up again. A few years after that, Samantha saw her name in the newspaper again, and this time, it had an interview with Samantha that literally never happened. It had quotes that Samantha had never said, and also quotes from her lawyer that simply never happened. So at this point, Samantha's like, literally everyone is profiting off of my rape, including Roman. And this is when she decided to sue him for sexual assault in the civil court. She mostly did this just to shut him up, but I'd be lying if I said that she didn't do it for the money at least a little bit. The truth was that she couldn't even afford to sue all these magazines that were printing false information about her. So yeah, she wanted the money. She felt entitled to it. This lawsuit went on for five years. Samantha once again had reporters outside of her house trying to sneak photos and videos of her and her family and reporters digging up her sex life. During this time, Samantha's lawyer, Larry, he went to France to depose Roman. They took a break and Larry went out to lunch and he didn't realize until he was done that Roman and his lawyer were at a table nearby and he was going to have to walk past them, which was super uncomfortable. When he walked by, Roman stopped him and said, Larry, come here. Larry, you should have seen her. She was so beautiful. You would have wanted to fuck her too. The lawsuit was settled after five years for a six-figure sum. Around this time, Roman was also getting ready to marry his next wife, Emmanuelle Senior. She was a French actress who was about 18 or 19 when they met, and he was like 51. They got married in 1989. By the late 90s, there were rumors that Roman Polanski was trying to make a deal to allow him to come back to the United States. It was around this time that Samantha came out of hiding. She had been living in, in Hawaii basically to try to get away from all the craziness that was happening in Los Angeles. In 2003, Roman Polanski was nominated for an Academy Award for the film The Pianist. A few weeks later, he won an Oscar but was unable to go to Hollywood to accept it. In 2008, his legal team filed a motion in L.A. County Superior Court asking for dismissal of the case on the grounds that in 1977, he had been deprived of due process of law. But the presiding judge dismissed it, basically saying, get your ass back here and then we'll talk. In 2009, Roman decided to go to Switzerland to go to the Zurich Film Festival and accept a Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, it didn't take long for the whole world to find out where he was going, and Swiss police met him at the airport and arrested him for the 1977 conviction as soon as he stepped off the plane. Roman ended up being sentenced to house arrest, after nine months of that, it was declared that Switzerland would not be extraditing him to the United States either. Apparently, Switzerland has a very specific criteria for extradition. 
they would only extradite if the person had at least six months left to serve. And they couldn't actually prove that Roman did because he was really only sentenced to the time he spent in the Chino State Prison. Not only that, but in the year that Polanski was sentenced, not a single person serving time in California for unlawful intercourse was serving more than six months. In fact, it was often no more than two months. Ultimately, they decided not to extradite him because the DA refused to hand over the key testimony, and it really started to look like the U.S. had something to hide. So that pretty much ensured Polanski's freedom. In 2008, a documentary was released about Roman's conviction. This movie was called Roman Polanski, Wanted and Desired, and it was made by the filmmaker Marina Zenovic. Samantha and her lawyer also actually participated in this film. After the release of the documentary in 2009, Roman actually wrote a letter to Samantha. The letter said, Dear Samantha, I watched Marina Zenovic's documentary for the second time and I thought I should write you this note. I want you to know how sorry I am for having so affected your life. Watching you in the film, I was impressed by your integrity and your intelligence. And you're right, they should give your mother a break. The fault was mine, not your mother's. I hope the pressure of the media has alleviated and that your family brings you much happiness. Best wishes, Roman Polanski. Samantha says that this note was written after Polanski had children of his own, and maybe that gave him a new perspective. It didn't change anything for her, but she did see that it had a great effect on her family, and it definitely alleviated things for them. Roman Polanski ended up being expelled from both the American Academy Awards as well as the French Academy Awards, which are called the Caesar Awards. The American Academy Awards said that the expulsion, along with the expulsion of Bill Cosby, occurred in part because, quote, the board continues to encourage ethical standards that require members to uphold the Academy's values of, rec values of respect for human dignity. In February 2020, Polanski won Best Director at France's 2020 Caesar Awards. This time, there was an uproar even in France. People protested, and multiple women straight up walked out of the award ceremony. The entire Caesar leadership board ended up resigning. Ultimately, Samantha says that she doesn't think he truly meant to harm her. She thinks he wanted her to enjoy it and be into it, and she gathers this from the things that he was saying to her. He did seem to want to be gentle and turn her on. She also explains that in the 70s, the whole free love ideals were taking over, and sex was this magical and spiritual thing all on its own. Like, people were really embracing this freedom to veer away from societal norms about sex, and people started experimenting in somewhat as far as pushing limits and crossing lines. But I do think that people in this era, they really thought they were getting closer to God or whatever, you know, their belief was. They thought that it was there, there was a spiritual connection with sex. Obviously, the reality is that Samantha was hurt and scared, and he did turn a blind eye to that, and he ignored her cries for him to stop. But one thing that's interesting to me is that when she describes the encounter, she says how nothing is being said, but, quote, he's in Hollywood, so I imagine he's filling in the lines, or something like that. And that just makes me wonder if he legit was, like, fantasizing that she was truly enjoying it, like the way he described it in his book. And that's not to excuse him in any way, at all. I guess it's just me trying to make sense of it in, in some small way. And again, I'm not a psychologist or anything, but I know that when people have trauma, sometimes they can dissociate. And this guy does have a lifetime of trauma. Either way, Roman Polanski is a pig, and I hate him, and I wish we would just stop giving him awards. In April 2021, it was announced that Polanski was planning to direct a new film with a screenplay written by himself together with fellow Polish director Jerzy... Oh, goodness. Skolomowski. Okay, not bad. The working title is The Palace. Polanski worked with Smolowski. Polanski worked with Smolowski. <laughs> Polanski worked with Skolomowski before on the screenplay of his first feature film, Knife in the Water, in 1962. There's one more thing that I couldn't figure out no matter how hard I tried, but I want you guys to know that I did try to address this. I just really want to know what Jack Nicholson had to say about all this. I mean, I know he wasn't there when the sexual assault occurred, but, like, did Roman just, like, borrow his house for a photo shoot? Like, did Jack Nicholson know he was bringing a child to photograph? 
Or, like, was this a regular thing for Jack Nicholson to loan his house for photo shoots and stuff? And Angelica Houston wasn't surprised that the girl Roman had in the bedroom was so young. So, like, I have to wonder, like, would Jack have been surprised? Or was this a usual thing for Roman to bring little girls over? And lastly, before Roman went to Chino State Prison for his diagnostic study, a bunch of celebrities threw him a going away party and Jack Nicholson was there. So, like, what did he think happened? Did he know what really happened and support Roman anyway, or is he just going along with the story that Samantha was this cunning Lolita and nobody had a cue and nobody had a clue she was underage? I don't want to dislike that guy, but sometimes I feel like silence and neutrality at a time like this is very telling. If anyone else happens to find a book or a news article or some kind of source about Jack Nicholson where he addresses the situation in any way, please let me know because I really would like to know. And if I find that information, I will update you guys. Remember, if you ever want to contact me with information, you can always email me at ddwest at brokenlimelight.com or you can leave me a comment on brokenlimelight.com. There are numerous pages where you can leave a comment and I will always respond to them. So that's pretty much it. There's the story about Roman Polanski. Samantha Geimer seems to continue to live her life. She's moved on from all that and... You know, she has come out with this book, which I feel is her way of telling her own story, and now it's out there. The fact that Roman Polanski is still alive and still free makes it kind of sucky. I mean, I hope, I really hope that the media doesn't come and start attacking Samantha again for some reason. But I have no doubts that Roman Polanski will try to come back into the United States sometime. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening once again. I hope you enjoyed this episode about Roman Polanski. Please continue to tell your friends if you like this podcast. And if you're listening on YouTube and you enjoy my podcast, please hit the subscribe button. I cannot get enough of you guys. I'm so, so happy to see that I have so many new listeners and that people are actually interacting with me on all of these platforms. If you'd like to suggest a case, just reach me on brokenlimelight.com and I'd be happy to look into it. Thanks again, guys. Until next time. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims, there's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt to Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.